we are at 302. I'm going to get this started. So thank you for joining um, for today's webinar on event insurance. Today we have Kathy Seacrest from the Fairley Group and Trish Black, um, USA Cycling's Director of Event Services. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and will be shared out afterwards. Uh, during today's webinar, please write any questions in the Q&A box and they will be answered um, afterwards via email. Uh, if you don't want to utilize the Q&A box, you can also send questions to Trish Black at tblack at usacycling.org. Um, we will try to answer some of them if we're able to during this webinar. But uh, other than that, uh, enjoy today's webinar. Kathy, you can take it away. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, good afternoon. Um, as Matt said, I'm Kathy Seacrest with the Fairley Group. I've worked with USA Cycling on their insurance program for over 20 years. Um, Fairley Group has been very involved for many years with USA Cycling. Um, Alex Fairley, our president, ha is an avid cyclist, and that's how we initially became involved. Um, some of you might know his son, who was a professional cyclist, Caleb Fairley, for quite some time. He's retired from cycling professionally now. But um, we have a very close connection with cycling. We feel like we uh, are, are a part of cycling in what we do, and we try to do the very best we can for cycling as a result. Um, we have seen a lot of things over the years, and it's caused this program to evolve a little bit. So we're going to talk about that today. Um, to give you a little bit more background on Fairling Group, we write insurance programs, provide insurance programs for the NFL, Major League Baseball. Um, we manage claims for the National Hockey League. We, uh, we take care of Major League Soccer and a lot of other smaller leagues, teams, clubs, et cetera. So we do know this space. Um, we think we know it better than anyone else out there um, because we are so well versed in it and we've worked in so many different areas. We have provided consulting services for many different types of programs as well. So um, I do wanna give you a disclaimer before we dig in too closely. The policy governs all of the coverage for USA Cycling. Um, we're going to go over the highlights of the program, the limits, the deduct the deductible, the exclusions, and we're gonna talk through how some of these things work, um, but the policy itself is what governs the coverage all, always. Um, you can get premium summaries and additional information on the website for USA Cycling. We provided the link here, and Trish can provide that for you as well, or you can, you can email event services at usacycling.org for additional information. The program that we're talking about today is the general liability program for competitive events. Those events and non-competitive events, the Grand Fondos, Gravel Grinders, Fun Rides, all of these things, camps, clinics, are all covered under the same program. In order for that coverage to extend, these, these events must be sanctioned or permitted with USA Cycling. If they're not on the permit application, the coverage will not extend. They have to be permitted and approved. Um, we can add kids non-competitive events as an add-on to these programs, and we're happy to do that. Just make sure you put it on the permit application and that'll make it extend. The hired and non-owned auto and moto liability insurance is something that has evolved a little bit over the years. We we can still offer liability coverage on an excess basis for automobiles and motorcycles, but you do have to be sure, and we'll go into this a little bit later, uh, that that is on the permit and that everything's approved and the drivers are approved, et cetera. Excess liability is also available. Um, the primary general liability program has a $2 million occurrence limit. And with the optional excess, you can get an additional $3 million limit if you need that for whatever requirements, for whoever the landowner is or the city or, or whoever may be requiring it, or if you just feel like you have a larger event that may need higher limits just to protect yourself, that's purely up to you. And again, it's on the permit application and we can provide all the information that you need from there. 
the coverage for the general liability program is, and some of you may be familiar with this from your other business operations, but it's a third party liability coverage that provides protection for the race directors, the event operators, when there is negligence involved in, in an event, when ne negligence causes either damage to property or injury to third parties. That's what the policy is designed to cover. It doesn't just provide a limit for the, um, the damage itself or the injury itself. It also provides defense to the race director. So if, if you're sued as a result of something that happens at a race, defense costs are provided by the policy. The limit under the policy is $2 million per occurrence, and that's for each event. It says per sanctioned event permit number, but that's e each event. So if you have a week-long event, you have a $2 million occurrence limit and a $4 million aggregate. Um, it's a little unlikely that that would ever come into play in, at least in my mind. Um, I do believe that if you had a horrific type of an accident that occurred, you would probably cancel the rest of the event. Um, and so it's not likely you would have a second, but if you did, this will pay up to $4 million for the whole event, but 2 million per occurrence. So you could have two $2 million losses or multiple losses up to a 4 million total. Um, and the, this next bullet point is just a side note. USA Cycling has taken on a $250,000 deductible under this program. And that deductible is there in order to keep your costs as low as they can possibly keep them. They are not passing this deductible back to the race directors. They, they set up a fund internally to, to cover the cost of this deductible. But insurance claims over the past 20 years, especially the last 10, have been so uh, so exorbitant, frankly, that it's not feasible to purchase this program with the depth of coverage that they have without purchasing a deductible as well. So they do have a $250,000 deductible for each occurrence. Um, and there is an option after the $2 million, $4 million primary to purchase a $3 million excess coverage with an excess liability policy. And that can be, uh, it's a checkbox on the permit application. The fees are noted there. Um, as far as who is covered, race directors, event organizers, local associations, officials, members. These are all critical pieces of the puzzle. Um, we'll talk a little more later about what other programs may not offer, but this program includes all of these parties and clubs and volunteers as named insureds under the program. If you're not an insurance geek, named insured really doesn't mean a lot to you. But what that is about is it's different than an additional insured. A named insured has broader coverage than anyone else under the policy. An additional insured typically is only covered for things that the named insured does. Um, for example, if I put on a race and I put up the barriers for the racers as they're going around a corner and I, I stack hay bales there and I stack them three deep. And anyway, and there's something in one of those hay bales that I don't know about. And a rider hits that hay bale and gets hurt. I'm considered negligent for that because I put them there. Well, I'm, I'm a named insured as a race director under the policy. So I would be defended and I would have coverage. And if I added someone as an additional insured, say uh, the owner of the premises, for example, if I added them as additional insured, they would also be protected for my actions. They would not be protected for their own actions. So if, um, if, if their parking lot or wherever, wherever we're having the event, if there's something wrong with it that they knew about and chose not to fix, this coverage is not protecting them for that but it is protecting them for my actions. And that's usually what landlords will want to see or sponsors is that they will want protection for the actions of the race director or the event organizer. So that's that's a very critical piece to this program. Um, this next slide goes into a little more detail about the things I just talked about. Um, it is critical 
that the written contract that you have between you and the landowner or the sponsor or whomever it may be, that it spells out who's responsible for what. Um, you want to be sure that you are protecting yourself contractually as much as possible. And we're happy to review those contracts for you. If you have something come up and you need someone to look at it, we are not attorneys, but we do know how insurance will apply. We will, there will be a lot of times we will say, you really need to talk to your attorney as well, but we can tell you if the insurance will provide the extension that they are requesting. And if they are asking for an additional insured clause, um, as long as you have that written agreement in place ahead of the race, signed and, and signed, sealed and delivered, the policy will extend. You'll need to check the box on the uh, permit application stating that you need this party named as an additional insured on the policy, and you will need to execute that contract. If the contract has a limitation of coverage, if it says that you are that they want to be an additional insured for the first five hundred thousand or the first million dollars worth of insurance. That's as much as they're going to get. If it doesn't have a limit, they will get the limit of the policy. So um, that that's a general overview of the named insured versus additional insured uh, exposure and how it works. Um, Trish, I saw a question may have popped up. Do we need to stop for a second, or should I keep going? Um, no, it was the question was if um, we could get to five million if it was requested by a venue, and I answered saying yes by adding the umbrella. Yes, the primary policy is a two million occurrence and four million aggregate. The excess liability is three million, so the three and the two gets you to the five, and it would actually give you a seven million dollar aggregate. So, um, going on to exclusions within the program. The policy that is written for USA Cycling is limited to the event itself. We are not trying to cover events that are not related to the race um, or that are not part of the race. A lot of uh, race directors will have really cool health uh, fairs and festivals and they'll have bouncy houses and games for the kids and uh, jump contests and fireworks and concerts and all kinds of things. And while those are awesome and they're fun and they bring people out for the event, that's not what this program is designed for. But cycling has taken care of you on that. They have a, a program, it's not a fairly group program, but they do have another program available where you can get additional coverage for that. So check on the ancillary insurance program if you're doing something other than a bike race, okay? Um, other exclusions. If, if you have automobiles or motorcycles involved in the race and you do not put it on the permit application, the coverage will not extend. That's critical. Um, it's, it's just not the way it's, it's set up. Um, and it's not covered under the general liability policy. It's a separate policy. Employees are not covered. If an employee is injured, um, if they are required to be covered under workers' compensation, it will not be covered under the general liability policy. So that, that's very important. Um, rider versus rider types of claims are not covered. If the race director is named in a lawsuit or a claim or if USA Cycling is named, yes, you are covered. If you are, if a rider brings a suit or a claim against another rider, that's going to be between the two of them. And typically, your personal liability insurance policies may pick up some things like that. It will depend on the individual. But if you have a homeowner's, it will usually pick up some exposure for things like that. Um, and this is all in the, the waiver that riders sign when they sign up for the race that... Um, they sign a waiver stating that they are not that they understand that there is danger in cycling. You can get hurt, and they're not going to hold USA Cycling or the race director responsible. And they just know that there's an inherent potential for an injury. Um, intentional acts. The policies always exclude intentional acts. It's just uh, you know you don't want to you can't ensure something that someone does on purpose. The the point is to cover accidents and unexpected events. This next one is a little misleading. Medical expenses within the general liability policy. Medical expense 
is, a, is different than bodily injury liability. The general liability policy does provide bodily injury liability. If someone is injured, if a spectator gets hit by a Peloton, you know, they, they, they slide off the road and hit spectators, that, that's bodily injury liability because they got hurt standing on the side of the road. Medical expense is a no fault type of coverage. It means it just, someone slipped and fall, some fell, someone tripped, someone, um, someone's, you know, kids were wrestling and somebody got hurt. And that is not covered. No fault coverage is not covered under the, under the policy, but bodily injury liability is. So, um, liquor liability is also not provided under this policy. If you're going to be serving alcohol or you have someone that, someone there that is, we do recommend you look at the ancillary coverage for that. On the hired and unknowned auto and the moto liability for competitive events, again, it has to be elected, it has to be on the permit application, it has to be paid for in advance, and it is limited to liability coverage. We do not extend coverage for physical damage for those autos. So if you're if you're using your brother-in-law's car to help with the event, make sure they have insurance on that vehicle, especially if if it's an older vehicle, then not everyone's going to carry physical damage coverage on those. I would make sure they have it because if something happens, you don't want that vehicle not to be insured. And this policy is not going to do it. This policy is designed for liability um, and it's excess liability. USA Cycling is going to require that the MVRs be checked. The insurance company requires that as well, but, but cycling has done it for a long time because we want to make sure that our drivers are as safe as possible. Um, and then the coverage for the liability only extends to the event organizer and to the authorized drivers, but it is excess of the insurance on the vehicle or the motorcycle. The owner of the vehicle's insurance is always primary. This provides excess limits and it would be a $2 million limit excess of the primary. And it provides coverage for the race director himself where the owner of the vehicle is going to have coverage under their own policy, this will increase the coverage for the event organizer and the driver. So um, there is an application, it gives you a lot more details, but that is the high level overview of what that is for. And this is also, uh, there's the last point here is very important. It's designed for coverage during the race. It's not for running back and forth to the airport to pick someone up. It's not for running errands to go pick up things that, you know, someone forgot. It is for during the race. So. Um, some of the reasons that race directors often buy this coverage, um, most auto policies will not cover someone else unless they're added to their, on a personal auto policy, unless they're added as an additional insured. And sometimes people just don't want to do that or they don't have time to do that. And this would give the coverage to them automatically. Um, there are often exclusions under a personal or business auto policy that have a speed contest or rate, we used to call it a racing exclusion. Not sure that that would always apply in the case of a bicycle race, but we have seen carriers try to fight claims using that exclusion. Um, another exclusion we see a lot is if an automobile is being used for a fee whether it's being used to carry something or someone, or if you're being paid to use it in this capacity, sometimes those policies will exclude coverage at that point. So it's another good reason to have this one. And it just gives you a higher limit of liability. Most uh, individuals do not carry million dollar liability limits on their auto policies, and this would give you a million dollars worth of liability coverage, but it is excess. So make sure they have primary coverage in place. If it, if it comes up and it excludes it, for example, in this uh, contest of speed, that's a different matter than not having any coverage at all, so. Kathy, will you go back up one step about the rental vehicles? Yeah. Um, it was at the bottom of the, the lab. That one? Uh, yes, and then, I think it's on the next one too, that we wanna make sure that 
coverage is in place for rental vehicles. Yes, this is excess, whether you're renting or borrowing, you must have primary coverage in place. And yeah, that's, that's right here. So. Thanks. Okay. Um, certificates of insurance. This is something we get a lot of questions on. Um, and it's often it's the only contact that you will ever have with Fairly Group is on certificates. We get these requests directly from USA Cycling. You submit them there. They send them on to us. We have a team that, that takes care of this that um, is dedicated to getting them processed as quickly as possible. But some things you need to know are that one, um, the certificates of insurance are, they're just a matter of information. It's, it's just what it says, it's a certificate. You can't change a policy by issuing a certificate. You cannot add coverage or delete coverage by putting it on a certificate. It can only confirm what the policy already says. So um, it's, it's just evidence. Um, it's not a contract between the insurance company and the certificate holder. But um, it is what you're going to be asked to provide to the landowner or the sponsor or the city when you're trying to get a permit. So fill out as much information as you can on those certificate requests um, and provide a copy of the sample certificate if you can when you send it. That'll make that'll save everyone a little bit of time if there's something that's questionable on what they're looking for. But USA Cycling will get those requests first. They come in with a permit application. When we get the request, it's after it has been confirmed that that permit has been approved and the event is sanctioned, and then we will get those certificates issued as quickly as possible. Our guarantee is one to three business days. I think most of you will find that we typically get them out sooner than that, but um, please give us as much time as you can. We try to get them out as quickly as possible for you, but. Um, sometimes there's some additional ad additional requirements that we have to go to the insurance carrier to get affirmed before we can issue them. So, ah, best practices. These are just general rules of thumb that will help you get things done more quickly, help us get them more accurately issued for you. Um, always ask for a, a sample of the written contract or the use agreement if you don't have the final contract when you're requesting it. Get a sample certificate of insurance. If there are any ordinances or regulations that are required, find out what they say so that we can check to make sure that those are going to be satisfied. Um, one of the questions you will often get from whomever you provide a certificate of insurance is why does it say USA Cycling instead of, you know, J and B whatever, whoever the uh, race director may be. It's because USA Cycling is the first named insured on the policy. So we always make sure that they are listed as a named insured on the certificate of insurance. We do provide a copy of the named insured extension and we include the race director as well. So it, everything's going to be there, but there are so many names sometimes it's not all gonna fit in the box. So they may have to read a little further than what they're used to. We do have blanket endorsements on the policy that if whomever is requesting the certificate will accept them, these will make things go more quickly. Um, we have a blanket additional insured, a blanket primary and non-contributory endorsement, and a blanket of waiver, blanket waiver of subrogation endorsement. These endorsements automatically will extend to anyone that the race director contractually binds themselves to if this is a requirement in the contract. Um, we attach the endorsement so they can see what it says. We don't want anyone to, to misunderstand, but it does require a written agreement. Um, a permit can be a written agreement. A legal contract can be a written agreement. Um, there's, there's usually something back and forth that they're going to require that says this is what you have to have. It's not going to extend if that does not apply. So... And Kathy, just to clarify that, when you say a permit can be a contract, a permit with your municipality. Permit with the city. Not, yes, yeah. permit with the city or the county or the state can be a, a, a contract, yes. It has to be with the party that's requiring it. Might be the better way to put that. And some entities will not accept blanket endorsements. Um, 
some require that that endorsement that's attached to the certificate have their name on it. And if that's the case, there is an additional fee because we have to go back to the insurance company and have them issue that endorsement. And, and then we have to have it attached. So there's just, it's just additional work and there is a fee for that. Um, when that is the case, we do require the a copy of the contract or the sample contract be provided so that we can review it in advance. And because some of these are a little, um, I'm not sure what the right word even is. Some of them are a little original. Um, some of them take a little longer to review than others. So it can take up to several weeks for the insurance company to review and approve them before they will issue those. That's rare. It doesn't normally take that long, but just be aware that it can. So the sooner we can get that information, the better. Um, the marketplace as a whole. Um, any of you who own a house or a car have seen your insurance go up, I'm guessing fairly dramatically in the last couple of years. And those are small parts of the insurance industry as a whole. And cycling has a very complex exposure. It's broader than most. We, we've worked very hard to make sure that cycling is not the only one insured and that for anything that is a, an expected type of claim that we can anticipate that, that race directors have protection for that. We want you to be able to put on events and not be worried about someone suing you after the fact. We want you to have the coverage that you need. And the cycling policy is very um, customized as a result. And insurance in general, is not a commodity. All policies are not the same. They're not all regulated. So we we watch very closely when we see other policies. Sometimes we're asked to review them to say, hey, you know, how does this one compare? Um, cycling is actually on the lookout always to say, you know, if we can, if there's a way we can help our members pay less to get this done, show us how to do it. So that we hear from them about these things pretty often and we often review them. Some of the, po the problems that we've run into in reviewing these is that lots of times they have very low limits. Some of them do not name the race director as an insured. And if you're not named as an insured, you're not covered for your own operations. You're covered for someone else's. Um, some of them have only spectator coverage. There's no participant liability coverage. So if a participant sues, it's, it's just denied outright. There, there's nothing there. And your participants are, are while they sign a waiver, we do get a healthy number of claims coming in from them. Um, often they don't cover paid officials. Uh, they don't cover temporary structures like bleachers or stages or um, uh, finish lines. They don't provide any coverage for abuse and molestation. We often see no coverage for the hired and not owned automobile coverage during the race or even around the race. So those are just a few of the problems that we see pretty often, but we, we strongly recommend that if you're considering a different program that you have someone look that over closely and, and determine whether or not those are risks that you want to take on yourself, so. Okay, we, now that we have some of our questions up in the corner here about, you know, do you really have claims or is, is cycling going too far with the coverage? Is, is coverage adequate? And where can we cut costs? And believe me, we have these discussions every year. Um, some of the claims here that are listed, um, this uninflated sign, we had a, we've had a sign like at a finish line that came down and caused injury to cyclists, this radio pace car claim. And some of these are absolutely tragic claims. I'm not gonna name any names on any of these. And some of you may be aware of some of them, but we had an official toss a radio to another official and um, it caused a crash that, that injured a cyclist very badly, ended up being a very large claim. We've had wheel support cars, parked cars, um, motorcycles, we've had them get 
they've stopped on during a race, they've been hit by other vehicles, I mean, by other, by cyclists and injured cyclists. We'd have, we've had them in blind spots when someone comes around a curve. Um, the electrocution claim is, ooh, we had um, volunteers putting up a sign and someone, when they were in the process of putting up the sign, touched an electric line up above and it caused an electrocution. Um, landscaping, we've had, and we've had landscape destroyed during specific events. So when uh, cyclists get off the, the track in a, on an off-road event, we've had spectators injured. We've had uh, time trial injuries. Some of these claims are millions of dollars. Um, they, they happen at the oddest times. Very rarely is it something that anyone would have expected. Um, our, the race directors that we've worked with, we have found that they work really hard to put on a, a good event and a safe event. And it's, it's the things that you don't expect that create the problem. So we ask that you, you keep an eye out for anything that can be done to prevent these types of claims. Um, we had a, we've even had an ambulance stop on a, on a road race and a cyclist hit the back of it because they came around the corner so fast and there was, there was some space, but there were so many cyclists they couldn't get over and they got hurt really badly. So those are just some of the types of claims that we have seen, but millions of dollars on many of these. Um, average claim, 635,000, the largest over 4 million. We have several still pending. We have to get these things right and we have to get as, we have to get the coverage as broad as it can be for everyone. And we don't want to ever not have enough when that claim happens. So um, risk management. It's important primarily for the safety of everyone there, the athletes, the spectators, the officials, everyone there. And if we don't uh, control or manage that risk, a lot of municipalities will no longer allow us to have the events there. Um, it can be a nightmare with, with regard to public relations. And it also makes it, it makes the insurance more expensive. If something happens and we're looking for a different insurance carrier the next year, the more publicized the, the accidents are, the harder it is to get it. Um, we want to reduce the risk of lawsuits by making it as safe as it can be without taking the fun out of cycling. That's, that's never been the goal. We want it to be fun for everyone, but as safe as possible. So have someone always out there looking. Look for... The, the ropes that hold the signs up, make sure they're noted and protected. Or for the hay bales on the corners, make sure that no one's, that if someone hits them, they're not going through them and that they get stacked back up because the next group may hit them as well. Those are the types of things we're talking about. Um, most risk management is just common sense. Look for the things that could be a problem develop a plan to address it and implement the plan. Um, USA Cycling has several programs that they've created. They have the Race Director Resource Hub. They have the Safe Sport Program. Um, officials are required to, to keep up with their continuing education. There's a National Safety Committee. They're doing a lot of things that you can take advantage of that will help you with mitigating these risks and keeping your costs down. Things that you can do, planning. Planning is huge. And there's always going to be something that comes up at the last minute that you didn't expect. Um, communicate with your team. Make sure everyone knows what's going on and how to handle something when something doesn't go right. Make sure there's enough marshals, enough uh, volunteers around the track that you can get someone where they need to be as quickly as possible. Um, the rules that USA Cycling has in place are there to protect the race directors and the cyclists and the spectators. They're there for everyone. And there's 
there's usually, if it's one that you think is a little strange, there's probably a story behind it. So um, waivers are mandatory from everyone, including volunteers. And those, if, you, if they sign up in advance, they can do it electronically. If not, if you have to get one in person, it has to be a wet signature at the time of the event. So, but if you can transfer the risk through insurance, it keeps you from being personally responsible. So let us know what you're trying to get done. Let us know what you need. We're happy to help any way we can. Okay, waivers, a little bit more on waivers. They are required for every event. Everyone has to sign one. Um, I think we've already covered the rest of this. Adults can sign electronically. Um, if it's electronic, it has to be USA Cycling's program, not someone else's. Um, and if it's a minor, it has to be a parent or a court-appointed legal guardian. It can't be just anyone. So the, the format in the waivers that we have, um, there are legal requirements as to the font size and the format. That's why they're set up the way they are. That can't be changed. Um, power of attorney documents will not be accepted. And um, and if someone brings their net, you know, if someone brings four kids, four teenage kids, not little kids, but four teenage kids to participate in an event, if they're not the parent, they cannot sign off for them. Doesn't matter if the parent said, no, take them. It doesn't work. So make sure they're completed properly, make sure they're legible, and that all the information is there. Um, other questions? I'm going to send you to Trish. And she'll reach out to us if she needs us. So most of these, I think she's answered more than we have. So she's got it figured out. Trish, is there anything else I need to answer today? Nope, there was one more. And I think we'll answer that one after the fact. Okay. Um, and yeah, so if, if nobody else has any questions that you think Kathy might be able to answer right now about anything in the presentation. Um, oh. I've got one just entered. Mm -hmm. um, Jeffrey Jordan asked, would you be able to compare contrast with NABRA or point us in the document that compares USAC and NABRA? And when you say NABRA, I believe you mean OBRA. And I think this is some back in earlier in the presentation, Kathy had a list of things that are common that we see in other policies. Um, back to that. It, and that's going to be... do that off the top of my head. We have done it, but their policies are also subject to changing every year, just like ours are. Um, so we would need to get a current policy to do that comparison. Let's see if I can find the thing. We have that. So, so Jeff, if you have a NABRA policy and you would like fairly to, to look at that and do a, a, summary comparison, they've done that for us before. Yes, and we'd be happy to look at it again if you've got one. Um, but like I said, if if we gave you one from a couple of years ago, it might not be accurate now. So let's see, where was that? Here we go. Um, watch for these things. Uh, if you want to take a screenshot, Jeff, um, watch for the lower limits on the aggregate. A lot of times they don't have a per event aggregate. They'll only have a single occurrence limit and there won't. So if there's more than one event, it only covers one time. Um, watch for where the race director is named. Check to see if participant legal liability is covered or if it's excluded. That's one of the biggest ones we see that participants are Participant liability is not provided under the program. I don't know about that one. I'm not saying this about theirs, um, but I would watch for that. But if you have a copy of it, we'd be happy to look at it and get back to you. And what I always suggest is if you if you have another policy that you're um, getting a quote for, look at the exclusions. That's yeah. going to be one of the big things to look at. Yeah, that's the best place to start. You don't have to be an insurance geek to figure out some of the exclusions that just don't make sense. So anything else? Um, no, there is no other questions, Kathy. I guess you did a good job. 
And I have one question that I will follow up with afterwards with Peter. And I really want to thank you for your time. Okay. Well, thank you.